Thank you, Kenneth, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here at our wonderful Student Research Symposium that we've been doing for about 10 years now, um, about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, in this division, I, I'm an Associate Professor of English, and I now just started in August as the Associate Dean for Arts and Humanities. But back then, I noticed that we had a student research symposium in the sciences, and I thought, we have wonderful students who do research as well, you know, different kinds of research, um, but they do that, and we wanted to showcase those students each year. So we began having that symposium around that time. And since then, the person who really has taken charge of that and done a wonderful job in maintaining this tradition has been Dr. Ann McMaster from the English department. So I just wanted to recognize her. She's sitting in the back row there. So maybe we can give her a round of applause for all of her hard work. Thank you, Ann. Um, after the program today, we'll have some refreshments out there in the lobby, so please join us for that. And we present an award for the best presentation, so we'll be doing that um, as well. Obviously, we have three wonderful students, so I, I, you know, I feel a little bad about even doing such an award because they all deserve that, but we're, we're very glad that they're here and speaking um, today. I also just wanted to mention a couple of other arts and humanities activities going on this weekend as part of the homecoming festivities. You can rejoin us tonight at 7.30 in the recital hall. There will be um, a concert with the singers, with the new jazz ensemble, uh, and different groups. So it's going to be an interesting experience. Also this afternoon, from 3 p.m. until 8 p.m., um, I believe right out here where the circular, well, the circular area is, the circular drive, we have the kind of uh, kickoff for the oral history program that the history department is doing. So you may go over there and see their Airstream trailer where they do the interviews, and if you wish, um, be interviewed about your experience at Millsap. So please stop by that um, as well if you can. So today we have three uh, wonderful speakers, and you can read about them in your program, so please um, do that. But they will each you know, give you an indication of what their, their talk is. So I'm not going to, um, uh, I'll, I'll just read the titles, but I won't read the, the full descriptions. Um, and I wanted to point out that these are papers written in regular courses in the arts and humanities. So we also have students always doing honors projects. They also often do research papers in their senior seminar, but those papers are not included in this symposium. There is an honor symposium in the spring that you can come back to and hear those longer um, papers and presentations. But these are regular papers for a 15 year class that, that meets for about 15 weeks, so they're a little bit um, shorter. So just wanted to give that context. In the program, it tells you what class each of these was written for last year. So we will first have Gracie Gatto speaking on Fra Angelico's San Marco frescoes, didactic demonstrations for friars. Then we'll have Sarah Owen speaking on reproductive control policies in the 20th century United States and South Africa. And then Roxanne El Shami will speak on a new kind of torture, the development of interrogation methods in the U.S. military from the Cold War to the War on Terror. So we'll have each presentation for about 15 minutes, and then at the end, we'll gather them all on stage for some questions and answers if you have some things you'd like to pursue with them. Okay, so again, welcome, and we will have Gracie Gatto first. I'm really excited and honored to share my paper with you today. I'll be talking about a fresco painting by Fra Angelico, who was a prominent Renaissance painter in 15th century Florence. Here are three of his frescoes from the monastery we'll be looking at. But first, I wanted to show a view of Florence, where the artist lived and worked. The name he's known by, Fra Angelico, is an honorific nickname that means angelic brother, which was given to him by his contemporaries because he embodied the Renaissance ideal of a perfect painter and was a devout monk above all else. The painting that I'll be focusing on is inside the San Marco Monastery in Florence. Here's a view of the courtyard. These faint paintings on the back wall are by a later artist. Fry Angelicos are all inside, as we'll see. Fra Angelico was commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici, the first of the Medici political rulers of Florence during the Renaissance, to create over 40 paintings throughout the monastery, especially in the monks' private rooms, or cells, 
Inside the San Marco Monastery, there are 43 religious frescoes attributed to Fra Angelico. He was the bid taker, the supervisor, and the main artist. But in order to get all of this work accomplished, he had assistants following his direction. However, six of the monastery self frescoes seemed to be completely executed by Fra Angelico one of which was the mocking of Christ with the Virgin in St. Dominic in cell 7. These cell frescoes are in no particular order. They were not intended to comprise a narrative, nor were they for the purpose of decoration. Instead, Fry Angelico created each fresco with the intent of the images aiding friars in meditation. He meant for them to be intriguing, but as a part of a centering spiritual exercise that consisted of the monks growing more connected with God. The importance of this project can be further validated by Fra Angelico's status as a monk. The 16th century Italian biographer, Giorgio Vasari, stated that Fra Angelico's name, quote, deserves to be held in most honorable remembrance, both as an excellent painter and illuminator, and also as a perfect monk. End quote. In this paper, I will argue that Fra Angelico created the works in the, in the San Marco cells to be intentionally simple, with the absence of violent action or strong narrative persuasion, and that he did this for the sake of the friars and their study of scripture. Fra Angelico manipulated traditional compositions of biblical scenes such as the Annunciation and the Mocking of Christ, as a means of portraying the scene symbolically, rather than in a way that would emphasize narrative shock or violence. For example, gestures of the figures are extremely important in these images. In fact, the gestures of Saint Dominic are the most important aspects of these images. Here you can see Dominic, the founder of the Dominican Order, in his monk's robe in both images. Since these frescoes were meant to be didactic, Fra Angelico emphasized what should be most important to the friars who would see them, not what would be most important to regular church-going Christians. As William Hood, author of an important monograph on the San Marco frescoes explained, Fra Angelico's emblematic depictions of these scenes, quote, were the starting point for a mnemonic process whereby the friar's meditation helped him to study sacred texts in preparation for preaching." End quote. Fra Angelico's implementation of what Hood called didactic pictorial language allows the figures to act as verbs, literally demonstrating to the friars how to pose during prayer and meditation. It is important to note that each of the poses and positions of St. Dominic portrayed in the San Marco cell frescoes were first demonstrated by and were direct imitations of the saint as he was observed in prayer. Dominic was considered to be the ultimate preacher by the friars, and each of whom hoped to achieve this level of spiritual connectedness through imitating him. Friars believed that posture, pose, or gesture could affect a psychological state which is why the gestures that Fra Angelico portrayed in these frescoes were so important for the friar's guidance. The 13th century illustrated Dominican prayer manual entitled De Modo Orandi, or Ways of Praying, described in detail specific gestures of St. Dominic while meditating. For example, here we see the saint in the top image lying on the ground praying and in different positions of prayer in the other illustrations. This manuscript was perhaps Brian Angelico's greatest tool in completing the San Marco frescoes. By referencing images from this manuscript, he, can, he created visual diagrams of the saint for the friar's enhanced meditation. While outlining certain moral and dogmatic theological relationships, the frescoes were also supposed to be unambiguous reminders of the friar's moral transformation through the rigorous, prayerful study of scripture, which would presumably result in their spiritual transformation and readiness to preach. The mocking of Christ with the Virgin in St. Dominic is housed in cell 7 of the San Marco Monastery. This work is remarkably 
a remarkably unusual interpretation of the mocking scene. During the time between Christ's trial and crucifixion, the mocking of Christ occurred three times. Immediately following his trial, after his condemnation by Pontius Pilate, and while he was nailed to the cross. A more typical or traditional scene of this subject, like you see here in Giotto's fresco in the Arena Chapel, depicts Christ at the forefront of the image, with multiple men surrounding him. Jesus is obviously suffering, and his tormentors typically appear either quite engaged in their torture, or rather nonchalant in regards to it, as is represented here. Colors in chiaroscuro and mocking images are often quite dark to symbolize the ugliness of the scene, and Christ is usually depicted tied up and bound by rope, though that's not the case here. While the men around him poke his body with sticks, whip him, spit on him, and push his crown of thorns to puncture his flesh. The mockers are portrayed nothing shy of harsh, violent torturers, as in Giotto's fresco. Brian Jellicoe attempted in the San Marco frescoes to uphold the value placed by St. Dominic on chastity, poverty, and most importantly, obedience. Here, Christ is positioned on a platform, higher than the Virgin and St. Dominic, creating a triangular composition with him at the top. By doing this, Fry Angelico gives balance to the composition and also puts Christ in the highest position, a hierarchy which is not common in depictions of the mocking scene because in the narrative, Christ is figuratively, emotionally, and physically beaten down. Fry Angelico positions Christ in this way in order to give him dignity, power, and praise that is so often taken from him in context of the mocking. The Virgin and St. Dominic are seated on a lower step, and neither of them is looking at Christ or at each other. Mary's face and gestures convey sadness or even mourning, as if she already knows what's yet to come for her son. She's wearing her traditional red dress, which is symbolic of Christ's blood, but with a softer, more somber, pinkish tone overlay. St. Dominic is seated directly opposite Mary, but they don't interact with each other. The Dominican Prayer Manual states that St. Dominic, quote, worked sweetly with his mind, end quote, which is shown here by the saint's unemotional yet contemplative expression. Perhaps he's meditating on the mocking that's portrayed behind him, and in turn, demonstrating to the friars how to be non-reactive in intense and emotional situations. The colors that Fra Angelico used in composing the mocking of Christ highlight the three main figures. The background is a light tan, and the pale turquoise rectangle behind Christ allows his halo and white dress to be illuminated. Although there are no distinctive orthogonals leading our eyes back, the equilateral triangle that's made by the three figures showcases Christ at the top, defining his holiness and significance not only in the painting, but also to Christianity. Christ is the most emphasized, but Mary's red and St. Dominic's dark dress, as well as both of their halos, help them stand out. Their figures and colors balance the composition and also show that they are supporting and caring of Christ. Rather than depicting a herd of men surrounding and tormenting Jesus, Fra Angelico only included a floating head and four floating hands, as he did not want the image to be overtly violent or solely about the act of Christ being tormented. He converted the tormentors into symbols. This allows the scene to be recognizable, while the actual mocking is not the fresco's main purpose. The floating head is spitting on Christ, while one hand on the right is using a stick to push the crown of thorns into his flesh and one of the other hands is swinging to hit at him. The mocking is symbolized, but the narrative is not emphasized. The Gospel of Mark states that Christ's tormentors put him in a robe, supposedly purple to symbolize royalty, as well as the crown of thorns and a stick as a scepter. Here, both the thorn crown and stick scepter are shown, although Fra Angelico chose a white dress to portray Christ's purity. 
Furthermore, Mark states that Jesus was blindfolded, beaten, and mocked. These are the three most significant and signifying elements of the mocking of Christ, which Fra Angelico carefully incorporated into his image without taking away from the didactic lesson to the friars. Looking back at Giotto's mocking of Christ, many of the compositional elements mentioned earlier as traditional in mocking images are present. Giotto's work includes many men surrounding Christ, six are in close proximity to him, and are poking, spitting at, and hitting him. Even though Christ is wearing gold clothing, he is not portrayed in a religious or powerful sense. Rather, Giotto's dressing of Christ in gold only further represents his mocking because the tormentors were belittling every aspect of him. While the composition is balanced with equal weight on each side, Christ is not emphasized, highlighted, or centrally located. The focus of Giotto's interpretation is on the act of mocking and tormenting, explicitly the violent narrative of this scene. The colors that are present are much darker and more muted than Fra Angelico's image. Basically, Giotto's painting is everything that Fra Angelico's is not. Giotto created this image solely as a portrayal of the story of the mocking of Christ. For anyone who sees the image to immediately understand that story. Comparing Giotto's image with Fra Angelico's, the difference in violent content and narrative emphasis is clear. Giotto's painting is centered on the violent beating of Christ, and it encourages the viewer to recount the story of Christ's mocking. With this in mind, Fra Angelico's is less complicated. It conveys a simple declaration of truth and holiness, and is an unobstructed, unambiguous lesson in prayer, contemplation, and mindfulness. To further emphasize Fra Angelico's intention, in cell three of the San Marco Monastery, he painted an Annunciation fresco, which portrays the same simplistic mindfulness of the friar's meditation as mocking of Christ. Fra Angelico only included the necessary figures, Gabriel telling Mary that she's pregnant with Christ, and Saint Dominic, because his incorporation into these frescoes was paramount to Fra Angelico's charity to the friars. Dominic is in the background displaying a gesture of prayer. The artist did not add any excessive figures, any distractive narrative, or any overly exciting elements. Only the three identifiable figures under a small vault. Gabriel's multicolored peacock wings identify him and represent heaven, or the divine. Mary is wearing the palest shade of red, again symbolizing Christ's bloodshed and a reference to the Eucharist. And she is gesturing prayer with her hands as she learns of her miraculous pregnancy. Dominic stands behind both Mary and Gabriel in the grass, with his hands held together in front of his chest, clearly displaying a pose for the friars to imitate. To further demonstrate Fra Angelico's intentional simplicity in the cell frescoes, he created a larger and more detailed annunciation in a stairwell hallway in San Marco. But its public setting allowed for a more narrative scene with richer colors. And in this private commission of an annunciation scene, Fra Angelico was able to portray an extremely intricate and vivid painting. The gold link detail is beautiful, but it would have been too distracting for him to use in the San Marco cells. Also, the lack of St. Dominic in both of these Annunciation images shows that his presence, or lack thereof, is meaningful. Fra Angelico thought putting him in the cell frescoes was imperative as a model for the monks. While he was not necessary in the public San Marco painting and would probably have been out of place in the private commission. The minimal depiction of violence, narrative, and decorative elements in both Annunciation and Mocking of Christ give evidence that Fra Angelico made these quite intentional decisions in creating these frescoes. He did so in order to not distract the friars with overtly captivating or distracting images. In the 16th century, Vasari stated that Fra Angelico was a painter 
with, quote, angelic style and rare and perfect talent, which was, which was a result of a simple and devout life, end quote. This describes the values that Fra Angelico intended for the San Marco frescoes, to be engaging and intriguing, but only for the sake of the friar's prayer, meditation, and contemplation, not for viewing pleasure or escape. Fra Angelico provided the friars with motivational tools and aids in these frescoes that could teach them, through the instruction of St. Dominic, how to become the most spiritually connected they could be. Thank you. on the civil rights movement in a global context. I think these policies represent the complex intersection between race, class, and gender. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm communicating the development of race and so the socioeconomic factors that influence these policies. However, feel free to ask questions during the question and answer portion. Um, Throughout the 20th century, global advancement in reproductive control technologies that included contraceptive sterilization and safer abortion practices changed the state's relationship to women's bodies and politicized pregnancy. They used reproductive controls to support their ideologies of white supremacy. This historical and rhetorical relationship between race and sex made black women in both the US and South Africa particularly vulnerable to manipulation through reproductive controls. In the US, new regulations in reproductive health care even radically changed uh, childbirth practices in the African American culture by regulating midwifery. In South Africa, the racial and economic bias in gaining access to an abortion caused a public health care crisis. In 1992, 50% of the caseload in the public hospitals, gynecological, and obstetric wards were from incomplete abortions. In anti-abortion, anti-feminism, and the rise of the new right, political scientist Rosalind Pachetsky wrote, quote, organized opposition to abortion has never, in fact, been a single issue movement. Although often unarticulated even by feminists, the meaning resonating from abortion politics had more to do with the compulsory heterosexuality, family structure, and the relationship between men and women and parents and children and women's employment than they do the fetus, end quote. Yet, Pachesky did not name one of the most important issues surrounding reproductive controls, white supremacy. The politics of population control and birth control were in direct conversation with, in conflict with one another. Monica Bahati Kumba explained, population control is markedly different from the concepts of family planning, access to birth control, or reproductive rights. While these latter concepts rest on the notion of equality, population control philosophically is an ideology rooted in inequality, racism, and patriarchy. However, population control movements utilized reproductive technologies to assert white supremacy. During the 20th century, some US states institutionalized eugenic sterilization boards. Eugenics was used on poor, both poor white women and non-white unmarried pregnant women in great numbers. By the late 1960s, 65,000 people had been sterilized against their will. Even white women presented a threat to quote the welfare of the European race by creating de degenerate families. End quote. This not only echoed earlier paternalistic racial rhetoric, but also suggested that despite having the majority of the population, white Americans felt threatened by ethnic minorities. 
To combat this threat, state and federal governments began to regulate women's reproductive lives. They began to consolidate whiteness by preventing underprivileged white women who threatened white supremacy from having children. In fact, Nell Irvin Painter in The History of White People explained, quote, in light of the long-standing prejudice against poor white Southerners, eugenic policies gave degeneracy a poor and Southern, female Southern face. Thus, whiteness centered on white women. Furthermore, eugenic policies combined population control ideology and birth control methods, perpetuating white supremacy. Although Southern poor white women were the face of degeneracy, eugenics made uh, non-white women vulnerable to unwanted sterilization procedures. In the US, almost half of the women who received federally funded medical sterilizations were black. According to historian Joanne Schoon in Choice and Coercion, birth control sterilization and abortion in public health and welfare, even even black women seeking out sterilization were forced to meet with boards that, quote, reinforced negative stereotypes of women and African Americans. Those very same stereotypes which made the oppressed system oppressive for so many of its clients, end quote. These stereotypes challenge femininity and the capability of black women to mother their children. The U.S.'s ambivalence towards the continued presence of the dysphoric African population fueled these policies. Unlike South Africa, which heavily relied on black labor, most, much of the U.S. felt threatened by its African American population. 20th century eugenic policies actively sought to reduce the number of African American births. The American Birth Control League helped facilitate the Negro Project, which tried to reduce the number of African American births by providing education and birth control to black women. Uh, the American Birth Control League's relationship between birth control and population control suggested that the revolution in reproductive control technology could aid white supremacy. In South Africa, white supremacist reproductive control policies were adapted to the different economic realities and racist ideologies. While the U.S. developed a more singular idea of whiteness, South African white society was fractured between the Afrikaners and the British. Afrikaners feared that they would become the face of degeneracy. Because of the conflicts of interest, South African eugenic, uh, thought, South African eugenic thought became reconciliatory. It advocated for miscegenation between two European fractions. According to Rhodes University zoologist James E. Durden, uh, quote, the two most viral nations of Europe could create a new South African nationalism, and quote, white women could solve the conflict between the factions. Whereas the U.S. used eugenics to protect white nationalism, white South Africans used it for nation building. White women were encouraged to have like, large families. For example, the U.S. The government declared 1960 was, quote, the year of the large family. They gave poor whites allowances for having children. The government also made it difficult for both white and black women to gain legal access to abortions. Framed using the rhetoric of the more Western birth control legislation, including Roe v. Wade, the Sterilization and Abortion Act of 1975 effectively limited access to legal abortion to well-connected upper middle class white women. South African sexual, uh, sexual control policies did not place as much emphasis on ensuring the continuation of white supremacy through consolidating whiteness than to ensuring white supremacy through increasing numbers of white, the numbers of white people. Furthermore, the white minority of South Africans had a complex relationship with black reproduction, which affected their use of population controls. Saul Dubov in South Africa, the paradoxes of place and race. Explain that relationship. Most settlers regarded Africans' prolific fertility as a political threat, while coupling their labor as an untapped economic source. Economically, they encouraged exploitation. 
Um, the demographics of South Africa cre created a paradox. Minority rule threatened South Africa politically but benefited them economically. Whites created a segregation system that forced indigenous blacks into overcrowded reserves, creating a permanent labor supply. And the map above, you can see that in the gray areas, it's about 13% of the land for a majority of the population. Um, <laughs> White's Creek, uh, Kumba explained the intersection between gender and class, quote, the neo-colonial relationship hinges on the exploitation of men's productive forces, but rests on the control of both the productive and reproductive forces of oppressed women, end quote. Reflecting this idea of South Africa, um, in South Africa, the government did not institute a family program till the 1970s when, quote, the surplus of black labor had reached crisis proportions, end quote, because of the increased mechanization of labor. Furthermore, these programs were mostly limited to the cities. The government threatened the working women's employment to encourage them into using birth control. Thus, reproductive uh, control in South Africa reflected not only the ideology of white supremacy, but also its demographic and economic realities. Reproductive controls changed the government's relationship to women's bodies. In both countries, black women were perceived as threats to, to white supremacy through their reproductive capability. Though both governments de uh, developed unique reproductive control programs, they used them to control their national identities and perpetuate white supremacy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Roxanne El Shami, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the very interesting and complex history of the field of psychology's involvement with the U.S. military and the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. I became interested in this history as I studied the captive voice within American historical literature in my connections class. What I found was that there is very much a connection between the use of psychological interrogation methods within war and psychology's ties with the U.S. military and the CIA. The relationship between these organizations provided a basis for the development of modern-day enhanced interrogation techniques, which some define as torture, and are still debated over today. Psychology as a discipline was only beginning to develop in the early 1900s and struggled to gain ground as a branch of science. In a mutually beneficial partnership, the American Psychological Association, or the APA, began working closely with the U.S. military and the CIA. The military and the CIA uh, needed the support of psychologists because it would give the use of interrogation techniques a sense of scientific legitimacy. And the APA needed, needed the access and funding that the two organizations could provide. It was a secretive and potentially dangerous relationship. The APA's prominence in the Cold War eventually led to the use of a new kind of psychological torture against the prisoners of war with programs like MKUltra and SERE schools, which I'll go into more detail about later. The influence of these programs persists today, playing a big role in the War on Terror's Enhanced Interrogation Initiative and sparking a national debate on the legitimacy of American torture. It was 2004, in the midst of the war on terror, when the photographs began to come forward. In an episode of 60 Minutes, um, an episode of 60 Minutes was aired in April of that year, featuring highly graphic photos of Iraqi prisoners being mistreated by American soldiers at the now infamous Abu Ghraib prison. Some of you might remember these. This prison in Iraq was initially run by Saddam Hussein and was known as one of his most notorious slaughterhouses. But when American forces entered Baghdad during the War on Terror, they took over the prison and used it to house Iraqis that were suspected of launching insurgent attacks on U.S. troops. 
Allegations started to come forward, reporting that there had been serious abuse going on at the Abu Ghraib prison, and a full-blown investigation began. The photos documented abuse that was not only physically agonizing, but psychologically devastating. One photo featured a man being dragged across the floor by a leash like a dog. Another of a man standing on a crate with a hood, covering his head and body and electrodes attached to his arms. This became an iconic symbol of the U.S. occupation in Iraq. In addition, there were a number of sexually explicit photos in which the perpetrators, both men and women, women were smiling. The American public was shocked, and the military and the CIA were embarrassed. What the Abu Ghraib prison scandal did was reopen the seldom contested debate on the ethics of the use of torture techniques. This question of torture was distinctly modern for its emphasis on psychological tactics, which were designed to leave, as historian Michael Otterman says, quote, deep psychological wounds, but few physical scars, end quote. Americans began to ask ethical questions, like whether the Abu Ghraib photographs were documenting the isolated actions of a few bad apples, or whether they were the result of a flawed system, and ultimately, whether or not torture is always wrong. To understand what classifies as torture within times of armed, armed conflict, we must look back at the formation of a very transformative set of documents. The Geneva Conventions were international treaties enacted by the United States in the 40s and 50s that protected the rights of civilians as well as prisoners of war during wartime. Shortly after 9-11, President George W. Bush signed a classified directive that excluded terrorists from the protections of the Geneva Conventions classifying them as unlawful en enemy combatants, rather than POWs. The Bush administration essentially gave the military the power to do anything to these terrorists in total darkness, regardless of the consequences. And in 2002, Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the United States, John Hume, drafted a set of legal memoranda, which would later come to be known as the torture memos. These memos effectively rewrote the legal definition of torture, arguing for the permissibility of techniques like waterboarding, sensory deprivation, and stress positioning. But the legal scope of the Geneva Conventions had been undercut many times in the past. In 1994, the, Clin the Clinton administration ratified the United Nations Convention Against Torture, but modified it many times. In effect, it agreed to a ban on physical torture, but circumvented the prohibition of psychological torture methods. The modifications to the treaty only served to muddy the waters even more in regard to what constituted as torture and resulted in legal loopholes. Psychological torture first began to develop as a modern military practice in the 1940s at the beginning of the Cold War era. When anti-communist sentiment, anti sentiment was high, the U.S. government officials were growing increasingly convinced that the communists had discovered the secret to mind control using new drugs and interrogation methods. This is where it gets weird. <laughs> the communists were supposedly able to convince their enemies into admitting war crimes that they did not commit. When he, when he learned of these drugs and interrogation methods, President Eisenhower stated that he would take an aggressive approach to fighting communism, which meant understanding this claim to mind control. The U.S. government began what became a 25-year process of experimentation with mind-controlled drugs, even taking cues from the Nazis. One agency that became particularly involved in this quest was the CIA, which was well-suited to conduct this research because of its mandated power, its secret budget, and its privacy from congressional oversight. The CIA's early defensive research on human behavior in the 40s and 50s culminated in a program titled MKUltra. MKUltra's $25 million of funding went towards understanding the perverse effects of hallucinogenic drugs on the personality and mental faculties. One drug closely studied was LSD, or the drug that the communists were calling truth serum. Highly controversial, these experiments were often conducted on unwitting subjects. In 1963, MKUltra was terminated for fear of legal repercussions. However, the intelligence community was left with two lasting legacies in the wake of this program. In 
the beginnings of an official interrogation manual that would be disseminated around the world in the coming years, and an ex accessibility to American civil society, namely universities and hospitals that employed psychologists. As the CIA began to realize that nothing worthwhile would come of their research with drugs, the quest for mind control took a different, more psychological approach. It was this research that would predict, produce the real breakthroughs. In order to effectively move forward with the development of mind control, the CIA needed a trained staff on hand at all times to plan, oversee, and help conduct these experiments. Research psychologists were the obvious candidates. Less esteemed in the world of science than, than for example, the American Medical Association, the APA grappled for funding throughout the 1900s. In a mutually advantageous partnership deal in the 50s, the CIA offered psych psychologists at various universities millions of dollars in funding to conduct targeted behavioral studies. Psychoanalyst Stephen Saltz, sums up this underground deal, stating that the leadership of psychologists put access to top military decision makers and, p and potential funding above taking a moral stand on the perversions of war. In addition, CIA officials would privately fly psychologists to international conferences and APA meetings where the CIA officials in, could, in turn, scope out the conferences in search of useful research papers on topics re related to mental manipulation. The research of one psychologist named, named Donald O'Hebb, discovered by an anonymous CIA official at a 1954 conference, would serve to put the mind control game straight on the path to formal interrogation technique and concurrently torture. During the three years prior to the conference, Hebb had been conducting studies on the effects of, quote, radical isolation upon the intellectual function, end quote. Isolating volunteer subjects in what he dubbed a black box, where all sensor sensory stimuli was blocked. Hebb concluded that, quote, even short-term deprivation produced a devastating impact on the human psyche, end quote, and resulted in symptoms comparable to acute psychosis. In the hands of CIA officials, Hebb's research would provide the basis for one of the fundamental tools of American military interrogation, sensory deprivation. Along similar lines, a young psychologist by the name of Stanley Milgram was said to have contributed to the growing body of work on interrogation methods of the mid-1900s. Stanley Milgram's obedience experiment was designed to test the limits that ordinary people would go to to obey authority figures, even if it meant harming other individuals. In this experiment, particip participants were seated in front of a large machine that was, said, that was said to administer varying degrees of electric shocks to another unseen participant by the press of a button. An automated recording of a man screaming in pain would play when the electric shocks were dealt. Milgram found that alar an alarmingly high number of participants would comply with these orders to administer the shocks thus causing severe pain and even, as it appeared in the experiment, death. His subjects, Milgram reported, were, quote, reduced in just 20 minutes to twitching, stuttering wrecks who were rapidly approaching the point of a nervous collapse, end quote. While much debate surrounds the extent to which Milgram's research was affiliated with the CIA's mind control project, there are significant reasons to believe that Milgram was aware of the practical application of his work. What the military and CIA took away from this research was that ordinary people, or soldiers, could be trained to torture. Psychologists' role in the formal development of interrogation technique expanded exponent exponentially throughout the 20th century. Forensic psychologist Rachel Kalbeitzer accounts that by 1970, military psychology had become a legitimate field of study. Because of their knowledge and research, research skills, Many psychologists became consultants to professional interrogators and participated in the questioning of detainees. Influenced by psychologist involvement in the Cold War, a new program was founded by the military, which persisted from the 50s to the late 70s. It was called the SERE program, which stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape, and was designed to train American soldiers to be become immune to the stress of torture. In this program, the U.S. military tested communist torture methods on its own soldiers. These methods focused on self-inflicted pain, 
sensory deprivation and humiliation, aiming to put victims in a state of delirium, dependency upon their captor, and suggestibility. Rising to prominence again in the aftermath of 9-11, SERE torture would be introduced overseas in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Cuba. This history provides one explanation as to how torture became institutionalized and remained in use by the military for so long. It is possible that many soldiers had re received training that fell under the legal definition of torture rather than interrogation, a fine line that has grown easier and easier to cross. Also, psychological interrogation coincides naturally with the intent of modern warfare, as the goal was to extract information from the enemy which was best accomplished through manipulation of the mind. However, the most logical reason for the advocacy of these torture techniques by the highest levels of American government was, as historian Alfred McCoy states, that, quote, psychological torture could more easily evade scrutiny than the physical variety, end quote. Not only did psychology as a field introduce the idea of cognitive manipulation to the world of intelligence gathering, but it informed the way that many people rationalized the use of torture throughout recent history. Famous experiments in psychology from the mid-1900s were often cited by scholars to ex explain why one might find it morally permissible to engage in torturous behavior. I, I don't have time to go through these experiments now, but I do mention them in my paper, so you can read it if you want, <laughs> the full thing. Um, in the wake of Abu Ghraib, the psychology community came under fire for turning a blind eye to and even helping to conceal its people's involvement in the U.S. interrogation abuses. In 2005, the APA formed the Psychological Ethics and National Security, or PENS, Task Force, which stood by psychologists' involvement in intelligence gathering, stating that, quote, psychologists have a critical role in keeping interrogation safe, legal, ethical, and effective. Today, psychologists and outsiders alike are being split into two camps. Those who believe that psychologists, involve, psychologists' involvement in enhanced interrogations was in direct opposition to the ethical principles essential to the APA, and those who believe, like the Pence Task Force, that without the presence of psychologists alongside the interrogation process, an even greater amount of human rights violations would have occurred. Psychologists close Psychology's close ties with military personnel and the CIA from the Cold War to the War on Terror has allowed for the interrogation of POWs to take on a new scientific approach focused on manipulating the mind and making it conveniently difficult for legal purposes to distinguish between interrogation and torture. Far from over, the US government, military, intelligence agencies, and the APA continue to deal with the consequences of not only sacrificing basic moral principles of just war, but doing so in complete secrecy from the American people. Summing up the challenge that Americans face in moving forward with the war on terror, in light of what the world has learned about American occupation in Iraq and other countries, New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis says, quote, the challenge of dealing with terrorism includes an aspect that we may not understand so well. We have to fight an unprincipled enemy without losing our principles, end quote. Including with some of the most powerful US agencies working towards mind control in exchange for funding and other benefits, the APA now serves as, in this case perhaps, the prime example of the devastating real world effects that arise when one abandons one's principles. Thank you. I'm going to invite them up to sit right here and to answer any uh, questions that you have if you if you would like to hear a little bit more about um, what they've been studying or some of their conclusions and so we'll go ahead and invite them up um, now. Yeah. We have a microphone that they can use to answer these uh, questions. So we have about 10 minutes or so for uh, question and answer and then we'll go and get some refreshments. So any questions? Yes. I have one for the last Okay. Is it possible that the torture techniques that these service members learned through this process was brought home, and people are being brought home as they come back into our society you know, in the transition from war? Uh, and the reason I ask is 
Well, I would certainly hope not, but of course the effects of war are long-lasting and I think that that is a definite possibility with certain individuals, but um, you know, I would say that um, our society, our uh, kind of our society just kind of takes care of that um, more than some other countries do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not an expert on this, obviously, but yeah, I think the effects of war are long lasting, so that's a possibility. Thank you. Yeah, I have a role in this. I think it's a typical person. Yeah, well, can you repeat the question, please? Would the FBI have a role? development of this against the typical person and wasn't directed against You know, that's something that I would like to look more into. Um, my paper kind of focused on strictly the intelligence gathering um, organizations in the military, so I would like to look into that question, but I'm not completely sure. Thank you. Other questions for either Roxanne or our other panelists? Yes. Please. The question for Gracie. Okay. <laughs> One art story to another art story. Um, Gracie, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the style, the front of the piece in the, in the press press, because it's um, distinctively different in some ways from the style that we see a lot of the pieces we play on. It's using in a, a very good style. Um, yeah, so that's that's interesting to think about. There, he especially in the San Marco. Um, I read about how he w he was commissioned, but he sort of had more freedom to do what he wanted to do there than in any private commission, um, and that he chose to use like lighter colors. He didn't use any bright reds or um, any real bright blues, which would have been more expensive and the church probably would have paid for it. But he just chose to, I guess, um, have this very simplistic style to match the um, message that he was portraying in them. And I'm gonna ask a follow-up question actually. <clears throat> when you were talking about the the sort of the hands and the, the face, the one face that was spitting on Jesus in that um, fresco. I wondered that it, it seemed that that head was represented as a darker complexion than the other people in that particular fresco. And I'm wondering if you saw anything in your research about if, if that figure was meant to be sort of um, you know less sort of European looking than the other. You know, and, and I noticed a. Uh, uh, an African or black man in the other, the Giotto um, one as well. So did you come across any of that in your research? Um, I did not. I, I don't know whether that was his intent or not. Um, and and because it, in that particular one, the head is not black and it's not brown, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, these are really old, so the um, reproductions or images that we have, I don't even know if that's exactly what it was supposed to be like. Right. But no, I obviously don't know. Okay, thank you, Gracie. Other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question for Sarah. Uh, Sarah, yesterday we heard from Ron Nixon over uh, in his presentation about uh, South Africa um, and Selma he had, he had discovered some rather surprising and disturbing um, instances of collusion between the United States government and the, and the, and the uh, uh, um, and South African regime. 
And I wonder whether or not you found um, in your research any instances of kind of interchange between the two governments with respect to reproductive products. Um, I didn't find anything specific, but within Southern Africa, uh, the Amer there were experiments going on. I'm not sure if this was through civil society or the government, but they were experimenting on with uh, very not tested birth control um, and implementing it on people. It was very dangerous, and that was going on near South Africa. I'm not sure. I, that's something to look into. But they were very much using one another's uh, policies as written. Uh, so they were looking to Roe v. Wade to write their act um, and to restrict it in very similar and scientific manners. Yes. Just to follow up on that, um, David, I was interested in, in your um, letting us know about the fact that degeneracy was applied to poor white women as well yes. as black women. Um, in terms of reproductive rights. And uh, perhaps you could talk just a little bit about the way in which white supremacists saw poor black women as. Yeah. Well, they saw them as a threat. Um, they thought that they needed to keep whiteness pure in a way. So they were, they felt that, for example, in one case study I read, um, a particular white woman had a low IQ, and even though she was uh, good looking in the report, uh, they wrote about how she was, you know, one of the biggest threats because she could uh, destroy the IQ of the white race and destroy the nation. And so there's, so they applied, they had a stronger sense of what they wanted whiteness to be, if that makes sense. They wanted it to be. Uh, stronger IQ, and so they applied more scientific principles, where in South Africa, they were doing it more by looks, and they were much more wanted more white women to have children. So they weren't testing IQs in that way. Great question. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. I have a two-part question for Roxanne. Okay. Uh, First of all, I'm curious how you get to um, uh, to uh, 21st century um, torture techniques um, from, of course, in uh, captivity narrative, which uh, we think of as a kind of a genre of a different, a different age. Second part of my question is, what do you plan to major in? What was the second part again? What do you plan to major in? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll start with the second part. Um, <laughs> I'm undecided as of right now, but I, I'm thinking about neuroscience, which is probably unsurprising. Um, and for the first part of the question, um, it took me a long time to come up with this, with this topic for my paper. Uh, I started off kind of researching some classic um, experiments in psychology, uh, some of the older ones from the 60s, like the Stanford prison, prison experiment. Um, and from there, I, I don't know, it was a lot of Google searches that kind of put the context of the, these older um, psychological experiments into a modern day uh, framework. And that's just kind of how that turned out. And so was there a relationship between the study of those techniques and the kinds of things you saw in the captivity narratives in terms of earlier, I know you read Mary Rowlandson's um, narrative about you know, being um, captured by Native Americans and things. So, was there a link between seeing the psychological effects of those of that kind of captivity, along with this sort of more recent example? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, some of the things that we studied in uh, connections, some of the cases like Indian captivity or Native American captivity narratives. Um, just focused a lot on not just the classic, um, like what you would define as captivity, you know, physical, but also of the mind, um, of the spirit, you know, uh, social captivity, uh, gender, race, sexual orientation, that kind of thing. So um, a lot of those narratives that we read in class 
kind of helped to really in inform my definition of what captivity really means. And that's kind of how I started thinking about, oh, you can, your mind can be held captive too, to many different things, in many ways. Maybe we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, done? Oh, I was gonna ask you, done, yeah. Go ahead, yes. Uh, <laughs> Gracie, the, the story of mocking and persecution of Christ evokes more emotion than just about anything in the Christian society. But the aspect that you showed was complete emotionless to me. Do you think that's that's intention? Um, yes, I do. The point of Fry and Jellico creating um, that fresco, as well as the Annunciation, um, was to be there for the friars. They're supposed to recognize it. They're supposed to know what it is, but they're supposed to meditate on it and um, and not not think about the story, not or not not think about it, but not be brought to that place of um, filled with emotion, sadness. Um, it is a tool for Brian Angelico made it as a tool to for the friars, the monks, to um, prepare themselves to be preachers. Um, and yes, it is supposed to be emotionless. Um, the Annunciation that I showed with the gold leaf around, um, that would be something more extravagant and more narrative filled um, would be what Fra Angelico's other works that would of private commissions or even in regular churches. Um, but for this monastery, his goal in each of the cell frescoes was to be simple, didactic, with St. Dominic and lacking in um, narrative and emotional elements. Okay. That's a, one final question? Or, okay, we have another one over here. Uh, how has the reproductive control policy affected current population? Um, that's a great question. So in South Africa, um, in post-apartheid, uh, they actually instituted some of the most liberal abortion policies in the world. Um, so uh, 20 years prior to that, uh, with Roe v. Wade, a lot of civil rights leaders, um, as mostly men I'm thinking of, uh, thought that uh, thought that Roe v. Wade was going to be used as a genocide on African Americans. And so I think that the population demographics um, and also sort of the time and space because uh, Roe v. Wade became a little earlier. So there's a little, there might have been a different understanding and also South Africa was affected very much by the HIV AIDS epidemic. So they had a different relationship to um, public health policies, but they had a very different reaction. And I think that goes a lot back to just population demographics and then just skipping over those other factors. Okay, do we have one last question? Or? Okay, yeah. I have a question for Gracie. Um, I know you're in the here, and a lot of kind of thought that the Medici's really throw your money at religion as a way to like show themselves as being super wealthy and there's a lot of like pushback against that. Do you think that these paintings and the simplicity of them might have been pushed back against the kind of over ornateness of a lot of the Medici era religious iconography? Um I totally understand what you're saying. Um there's I have not come across any evidence one way or the other. Personally, I think no, because um, 
Brian Jellico was a monk. He lived in the San Marco Monastery um, during the time that he was painting all these and a little bit after. And I think that he was such, so devout to religion and to this lifestyle that I don't think he would, um, he would do anything like that out of revenge or, you know, whatever. I think that his intent was very pure in making these. Okay, well, we very much appreciate your being here and helping us to um, learn from and celebrate the, the work of these students in their classes. So please do join us outside for some refreshments and you can chat with them a little bit more out there. So you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much.